aliens got it right, they got it wrong. In space, no one can hear you scream. The point is, in space, there's no sound, because sound is a wave, needs some medium to travel in, and there's no such medium in space. Roddenberry knew that, but he knew without sound there would be no syndication, so he decided to, <laughs> to, uh, to err on that side. And uh, I used to live in Cleveland, and I used to love to watch baseball, and the, what used to be the best baseball team in the country. And, and, um, and if you sit in the back and you watch a baseball game, you, you, and you see a home run hit, you hear the crack of the bat a lot later than you see it, because sound travels more slowly than light. But again, it would, have, it would have destroyed the dramatic tension. So I'm very happy that they kept the sound in space. Now, to just to sort of, in, in the interest of equal time, when I taught at Yale, my student came in right after Star Trek VI came out, and um, he normally wanted to talk about just science, but he said, you've got to see this. You've got to come see Star Trek VI. So I went the next night, he said, you've got to see this scene. And in this scene, by the way, I should say that these assassins come, they, they, they assassinate Chancellor Gorkon on his vessel. When the, the Chancellor got shot, his blood came spurting out in nice spherical droplets, which is, of course, what, what liquids do in a zero-gravity environment. If you're as old as me, you remember the astronauts drinking Tang. Well, all of you look younger than me, but, but in the old days, they used to drink Tang and they'd blow it out there. You remember, because you're a lot older than me. But, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, what, what, what's Tang? <laughs> and it would be these nice spherical droplets. And so, you know, what do you learn from that? You, you don't learn much physics, but you learn how easily excitable physicists are. Because <laughs> they never get to see anything done right on TV. Right. And so, uh, that's, you know, that's just one example of every now and then they do do something right. So those are two examples for you. Warp drive, wormhole. Can, can you tell us about what Star Trek gets right and wrong? Yeah, what's amazing about, about those things, and when I, when I wrote the book, what surprised me is those are among the most sort of fantastical things in Star Trek, the kind of things that seem the farthest out. And what is amazing is that they're not impossible. At least we can't say that they're impossible. I mean, the, the motivation is clear. Traveling at the speed of light doesn't get you very far. The distance between here and the center of the galaxy is maybe 30,000 light years. So even traveling at the speed of light, it'd take you 30,000 years to get to the center of the galaxy. That does not make for an exciting episode. <laughs> and so, uh, so they had to figure some way to go faster than light. But the problem is that you all learn in school in kindergarten that uh, you can't travel faster than the speed of light. That's what Einstein says, right? But you have to be like a lawyer and parse a little more carefully. You can't travel through space faster than the speed of light but space can do whatever the heck it wants. And so in fact, had Einstein been around, he would have thought of something that he would have called warp drive. And, and, and warp drive, of course, is a way to go faster than, than, than light. And the writers, of course, if you read how, they, how it's supposed to happen, of course, it's, it's nonsense. But in fact, in principle, you might be able to do it. All right, beam me up. Scotty yeah. has to be one of it has, has to, be to be the most quoted line from Star Trek. So, yeah, no, um, it's it's the thing that people who don't know anything about Star Trek know. Uh, now, before you describe it, will, will you explain um, why it was it was kind of created for the show to save on production costs? You got it. In fact, what's really neat is that in science fiction, like in science, money often determines what's possible. And so Roddenberry didn't have the money to show the animation for a starship landing. So he said, "How are we going to get people to the planets?" And he said, "Well, we'll beam them down." And so that's how beaming happened, because they just didn't have the money to do it, which, you know, so all, which has become a staple of our culture. And in fact, actually, it was the thing that got me interested in, in writing the book in the first place, because I travel a lot, and I would love to not travel. I just came in from Japan, and not, you know, just avoiding security alone would be, would be worth it. But uh, um, so the question is, how do you make a transporter? Right away, I realized I wouldn't make a transporter the way the Star Trek writers tell you. They tell you it's really simple. You read the Star Trek technical manual, I know you must have it. I do. And, um, and, and, and everyone out there does. And so they tell you, simply, I, I take you and I zap you and I vaporize you and turn you into a matter stream and I take the, your atoms and move them from there to here and I put them back together again. Now that causes some problems because just to vaporize you, to turn you into energy, releases an energy equivalent of about a thousand hundred megaton nuclear weapons explosion. So it's not environmentally friendly. So that's a problem. <laughs> But the real problem is a law of physics. The real reason, unfortunately, the transporter is impossible, and I hate to tell you that, is impossible, is a law, fancy law of physics called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which says that I can't know where every atom is in your body and what it's doing at the same time. I can know where it is, but then I won't know exactly what it's doing. So I can't make an exact replica of you over here. I can make an approximation, but the pro actually, the Star Trek writers knew that. So they created Heisenberg compensators. 
Okay, so if you watch the episodes, if ever if there's ever a problem with the transporter, it's the pesky Heisenberg compensators. And Michael, <laughs> Michael Okuda, one of the art directors, was asked, "How do they work?" And he said, "He gave the best answer I could think of. He said, very well, thank you." <laughs> do you guys want to see how you get beamed up when you're actually on Star Trek: The Show? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, so here's, here's the camera, and here's the shot, right? This is all you're going to see in the shot. And let's say the director is um, Anson Williams, who was my director, Potsy from Happy Days. And he counts down from 10 to 1, and I'll show you. So you guys count down from 10 to 1. This is me getting beamed up. You got it, yeah. <laughs> that's how they, I'm sorry to break your hearts, but that's how they do it. <laughs>